We got a match here between Capricorn and Bricks Twenty for J League. And uh, looks like we have one emphatic spectator who's rooting for Bricks. Let's look at this kingdom. So we've got uh, draw. Um, paddock draws indirectly because it gives you horses which draw. So each paddock is kind of net one card because it itself takes up one spot, but it gives you two horses which each draw one card. Uh, Lost City also draws you net one card. Archive is also like delayed draw. Oh, is someone talking? Stuff with volume. I guess that was just someone who wasn't muted. All right. Oh yeah, archive is like delayed draw. The turn you play it, it's basically like a cantrip. It's plus one action, and then you pick one card from the top three of your deck. And then the next two turns, it'll be like net one draw because you get to put another card in your hand. Uh, so you have plenty of draw. You also have actions in the form of Workers Village is a village, and Lost City is also a village. You got plus buy with Workers Village. And we've got uh, trashing with monastery or church. So I think you can build reasonably big here. Uh, my thoughts, uh, Worker's Village would be important mostly for the plus buy. There's not a huge number of terminals you want to play, although Paddock's a good enough terminal that you want it. I would think that you just end up playing a decent number of Worker's Villages, Paddock's, maybe some Archives and Lost Cities in there. And then maybe you build to, hmm, Double Province? Vineyard's also very viable. Uh, way to score because you, you also have like a ton of extra horses at the end if you play your paddocks on the final turn and you don't have to spend the horses so uh, vineyard is quite appealing as well anyways let's look at how they opened so oh no oh, 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 oh. we'll have to talk about this so they both opened with workers village which just seems like an egregious mistake you, you don't open with villages. It's a, almost always a really bad idea because in the early game, the thing you want to do is get a card that improves your deck immediately. You want to you know, jumpstart your deck as quickly as you can. And so I would almost never open with any card that didn't, in like the next shuffle, benefit my deck. And a village is never <laughs> going to benefit your deck the, the first shuffle of the game because the value of a village is lets you play extra action cards. And if I had two packs... Or, oh goodness, oh no, I haven't gotten to that yet, but I'm, based on the comments, apparently I'm going to uh, shortly arrive at some even worse decisions. But supposing I had like two paddocks, or two harvests or something, I want to play both of them in the same hand. You know, having a worker's village gives me an extra action so I can play both of those. The problem is, after turn one and turn two, your first two buys of the game, there's just no conceivable way you could have put <laughs> two terminal actions into your deck alongside the village. Uh, barring very exceptional circumstances. And so that village is not doing anything for you. And so it's going to waste and you could have bought a better card. You'll certainly want workers' villages eventually, you know, once you do have a bunch of actions, a bunch of terminal actions like Paddock or Harvest, and once you do have a bunch of plus buy, you'll eventually want workers' village to resolve all that. But absolutely, uh, workers' village is, I think, a huge error in the opening. I think probably double church, church silver, something like that. You get a little bit of trashing with church, and then you have the likelihood of hitting five. I think I'd open with double church. Uh, reasonably likely to hit five anyway, because you just like set aside a bunch of coppers one turn, and then have five coppers in hand the next turn. It's also likely to get you baths points, because you're, you're going to be not buying anything. I think double church is probably my preferred opening. Uh, they do, uh, Capricorn at least picks up a church uh, with the Worker's Village. Church and Silver are both fine cards. Bricks eventually gets a church. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I think I've arrived at the, the portion of the game that Nerdbound was referring to. <laughs> so turn four, Bricks buys a potion and a copper. Now why would you do that? I... I have no idea. What could they possibly be thinking? So the... The potion just seems... Way, way, way too early. They have two total actions in their deck that far. They've they've not built at all. <laughs> Why are you trying to score victory points four turns into the game? Boy, uh, and then the copper. Why would you want a copper? 
Ah, <laughs> I can't see any reason on this kingdom you would ever want to put an extra copper into your deck. I'm I'm at a loss here. I mean, maybe if you're gonna buy commerce, and you maybe now nah, even then, like a copper for a gold wouldn't even be worth it. But maybe you could buy a copper thinking that like you could power up your commerce buy. But they didn't buy commerce. That yeah, that that turn <laughs> thoroughly eludes me. So I'm gonna pretend that didn't happen and move on. Uh, Capricorn just sets things aside. That seems fine. I think if I had two churches, I would set both church. I would play both churches, uh, so as to get in two trashes the next turn, most likely. Um, not a hundred percent sure of that, but that's something I would consider doing there. Uh, Paddock I like as a first five. Paddock's a pretty strong card. Uh, why? Monastery and vineyard. I have no idea what Brix is thinking. And a raider? A lost city. I, I don't. Okay, I'm caught up now. But it's going to take me a few minutes to digest uh, what's going on in, uh, in Player One's deck. Because I really can't explain that. Okay, Capricorn also bought a raider. So we should talk about why that's a bad idea. <laughs> Raider sucks. Uh, Raider's really, really bad. You rarely buy it. Uh, for starters, compare it against gold. Uh, both of them give you three coins. The difference is, gold gives you three coins every turn. Raider gives you three coins every other turn, because it stays out of play. And so, uh, Raider is like half a gold for the price of a gold. And it does have like a minor discard attack, but it's usually not significant enough to actually hurt very much. And so you wouldn't want half a gold over a whole gold. And then on top of that, consider that you really shouldn't be buying golds in the first place because gold itself is a really terrible card. In this kingdom, I would not touch Raider or gold at all because there's just much stronger action cards. I'd rather be spending all of my key buys on Paddock or Lost City or Archive or Worker's Village or what have you. Yeah, uh, it is absolutely uh, a mistake that three Raiders have been bought <laughs> thus far. In any case, Capricorn has hit six. I would think this should be another Paddock. Paddock's a really good card. It gives you money and it draws. And eventually, once one pile rolls out, it won't even be a terminal action card. It'll be non-terminal. Uh, so Paddock seems like probably the strongest card in this kingdom, I would think. Yeah, I would, just, I would buy Paddock here. Nothing else. They take a worker's village because... Why would they need a worker's village? They don't... Wait a second. Capricorn has exactly one terminal action card in their entire deck, which is that paddock. So the need for villages... Um, they're decorative, and it looks nice. It's nice art. They're going from this aesthetically pleasing deck. Yeah, again, the main value of a village is just that it lets you play more terminal action cards. You don't need to be shoving your deck full of villages if you don't have terminal action cards yet. Because those villages are just doing nothing for you. Uh, I would think that you could buy a bunch of paddocks, and then you'd be like, oh, maybe I want some workers' villages so I can play all my paddocks. That would make sense. But I really cannot conceive of why you'd want a workers' village in that scenario. Hmm... Again, I would buy Paddock here. Seems like clearly the... Why are they taking silver? And then the state? <gasps> what are you... What are, I'm so... Okay, new theory. Maybe they've misinterpreted commerce, and they just, like, missed the last two words. And what they thought commerce said was something like, get a gold for, like, every unique card you've gained ever. And so they're trying to collect, like, one of each card with the intention of buying commerce and getting like a million golds. This is <laughs> my best theory currently for why Bricks is buying what they're buying. Why would you buy an estate? Why would you voluntarily put an estate into your deck? I, estate's a bad card. The reason cards like church and monastery are so valuable is because they trash the, st why didn't, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness, goodness me. Why didn't they play their church? Are they? Are they trying to trash the church? Why would you trash your church? Okay, they didn't trash their church, so why didn't they play the church? Okay, maybe another confusion they've had. Maybe they thought church was like a mandatory trasher, 
And, like, if they played their church, they were going to be forced to trash a card. So, like, I don't want to trash a card. I'm going to not play my church. It's optional, right? The church lets you set aside a card for free, and then you can choose whether to trash or not. So, for example, on that hand, they were about to trigger a shuffle. They could have played the church, set aside a vineyard. A vineyard's a junk card, right? It's not doing anything for your deck except being worth points at the end of the game. You don't want vineyard to be in your hands. So you play the church, you set aside the vineyard. That vineyard is now stuck out of your deck for that next shuffle of your deck. So you now have got a, a deck that's slightly cleaner than it otherwise would have been because there's one less vineyard getting shuffled into it. And so even if you don't plan on trashing, just setting aside that vineyard, getting it out of the way, the same thing on the monastery even, uh, would be a benefit because your deck is going to be a little bit cleaner than it otherwise would have been when you go to shuffle the deck. Proteus asks, why brick... I really cannot answer any questions about the internal monologue in Brick's mind. It is a, a black box to me as well. Um, my running hypothesis is they're trying to collect one of each card because they have misinterpreted commerce as being get one gold for each unique copy of a card you've ever gained rather than a card you've gained this turn. And so they're just buying one of every copy of the card to power up the eventual commerce that's coming. Uh, beyond that, I really have no other theory that could make sense of their, their sequence of buys. Okay, Capricorns hit 10. I would think some combination of the five cost cards like Archive Paddock, Lost City Paddock, Paddock Paddock, emphasis on the paddocks. They bought a gold. Well, that's honestly not that bad. Uh, wait, no, 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 let me, let me double look. Uh, that, that should, that's actually just like strictly worse than what they could have done. They could have bought a Worker's Village and then bought Commerce. And they would have gained a Worker's Village, and they would have gained horses from their paddock play. And so Worker's Village Commerce would have just gotten you two golds. So they basically passed up on a free gold. Because there's, I, I mean, I don't know what argument you'd give for buying Worker's Village in one gold over Worker's Village in two golds. My, my guess is they just kind of overlooked the, uh, the Commerce play there. Okay, Brick has eight. I would think you buy paddock, and they're just, they're just not going to buy the paddocks. Um, I, I realize this is very wishful thinking on my part, but I would very much like it if they bought more of the paddocks. It's a strong card. Um, instead, they really, really love the Worker's Village. Just like, look at the state of the kingdom and what cards are missing. There are eight Worker's Villages and a Lost City missing. So you would think that, given that there have been nine total uh, action cards taken from the supply... Uh, that they ha would have nine surplus action cards in their decks, so like 11 total terminal action cards uh, around. As a matter of fact, they've only taken one apiece. They each have exactly one terminal action card in their decks, Paddock, which means they need exactly zero villages to play every terminal action card they have. And they have nonetheless bought eight villages between them. Nine villages if you count Lost City. Lost City at least gets a pass because it's a draw card, so you could buy it for the draw. But the workers' villages are uh, a little, a little bizarre. All righty, all righty. Let's go bricks with the paddock buy. I like that. Now trash those coppers. Yep, yeah, one. Now another one. Trash the other one. Copper's bad. <sighs> Why would you trash exactly one copper? What would make you think like my my deck? Like, kind of doesn't want coppers, and then you trash them, and you're like, all right, that's enough. I have exactly as many coppers as I want in my deck. Like, you either should correctly think coppers are bad, I should trash all of them, or just be confused about coppers entirely. I'm not sure what would make you want to trash one copper and not the other. Hey, yay, yay. So now you play the church, you set aside the two green cards, you buy a vineyard, I guess. So you actually, you could just set aside all three of those cards and take the last two baths points with the intent to buy vineyard next turn. That might be nice. Yeah, I'm liking this, I'm liking this. That's in buys. Okay, I like that, all right. Bricks has done a thing that makes sense to me. I, I understood that turn. That was a good play. 
Now, unfortunately, despite having a bajillion Orcus villages, it's going to be a little awkward if they don't draw any of them here. Okay, trash the copper. Trash the copper. Kill the copper. Or the estate. Estate 2. Okay, estate. Wait. So they know you should trash estates. So why were they buying estates? This could be province. This could be commerce. This could be paddock. All those sound fine. And I think province is probably best. Pile's getting a little bit low. I don't think their deck has enough action cards in it for vineyards to be better than province at the moment. Okay, so we're we're 17 turns into the game. Uh, for quite a while now, it should have been the case that they would be drawing their entire decks every turn. Right, this is a strong kingdom. You got good trashing, you got good draw, you got good actions, you got plus buy. Uh, there's all you need here to build a nice, big, strong engine that draws and plays every single card in your deck every single turn. And I think you can get that run running uh, easily by like, I don't know, turn 9 or turn 10, uh, maybe earlier. And so it says, I think, a lot that we're 17 turns into the game, almost twice that amount of time, and their decks are still playing five or six cards a turn. The clear order of progression in most kingdoms is you want to trash your starting cards. You want to get all the estates and all the coppers out of your deck. So just getting in the way, gumming up your engine, stopping you from drawing. Then you want to add draw cards so that you're drawing your whole deck. In this case, Paddock, Lost Cities, Archives, etc. Then, once you've got a nice, steady deck, it's drawn itself every single turn, it's got all the junk out of it, then you start adding your payload cards. So maybe you buy Commerce to throw some golds on the deck, or you just buy additional Paddocks, because Paddock is both draw and payload. And then your deck starts to escalate from there. And you buy a little more draw, you add a little more payload, and eventually you got a nice, steady, big engine up and running that can buy two or three provinces per turn, or a province in a vineyard, or whatever. Their order of priorities is, uh, well, it's a little mysterious what it is, but it's not that. Paddock. Archive would be fine, too. Okay, good. Paddock. Alright, this game is looking to be in Capricorn's favor. Uh, they have a decent points lead, and it's not as though Bricks has a clearly better deck or anything for compensation. It's possible. You know, they're not out of it yet. They're going to get a province and a vineyard here. But uh, I would think Capricorn's in the lead. Wait. They got that potion. Turn four. They have now acquired a total of one vineyard prior to this turn with the potion they bought turn four. That's, uh, well, it's not good. I mean, this is probably why you don't buy po potions so early, right? It is potion itself is a junk card in your deck. It's not doing you anything except, in this case, getting you vineyards, which are also junk cards in your deck. And so that just slows down your deck uh, tremendously. And if you build the real deck first, that again draws all the cards and plays them every turn, then you add a potion to that deck, say around turn 8 or 9, well you're seeing your potion now every turn, and then you've emptied the vineyards by this point in time, despite adding the potion twice as late into the game. Because you're seeing the potion every turn instead of every like 5 or 8 turns. Trash those coppers. I think I'd trash coppers over the state at this point. I might value the points more than the money. 
they chose to trash the estate instead, that's still fine. Although it still makes me wonder why they bought the estate in the first place. I must admit my, my misreading of commerce theory is not holding water, given that they did not buy commerce. Yeah, the, the draw is a little lack. Oh, the, the draw on their decks is a little lacking. The, the draw on the kingdom is not lacking. There's like three nice stacks of draw cards. Maybe they misread commerce, but then... Oh, that's a good theory. <laughs> All right, yeah, new, new best theory. I'm going to go with nerdbound theory. They were doing the commerce strategy. And then they took a second look at it, and they're like, oh, it actually is uh, just one turn. Never mind. All these estates I bought were useless. Let me go back and trash the estates that I bought again. That would make some sense. Okay, Brix is kind of catching up a bit now. As Capricorn, I would have added a potion at some point. Certainly not when Brix did, but, like, eventually... In any case, Capricorn's going to get this province. Yeah, I'm liking that all the paddocks are now being taken. Will it be in time, though? Yeah, so if you're playing the vineyard strategy, you probably don't want to touch provinces at all. Like, Bricks isn't touching provinces now, which is good, but they did buy province earlier. And the rationale is, you know, the vineyard thing might take longer to get going, right? you got to get all the eight vineyards, which either is going to happen once per turn, or it's going to require taking multiple potions, and then you got to get a ton of actions to power it up. But it's eventually going to have so many points that it can outscore provinces pretty easily. And so... If you're playing the vineyard thing, you like the game to go longer, right? You can keep building and keep building and eventually outscore them. And so if you don't touch the provinces at all, then the game's not going to end until your opponent has a deck strong enough to buy all eight provinces, which is like a big threshold. Whereas if you buy a few of the provinces, you might be scoring some points in the short term, but you're reducing the number of turns that the game's going to last, and those last turns are a lot more valuable for you than they are for your opponent. And so it makes sense to just leave all the provinces to your opponent and just be like, I'm going to go straight vineyards and outscore them with vineyards entirely. And they can't end the game fast enough to stop me. Okay, so why do they want exactly seven money? Perhaps they just didn't want to play the second church for some reason? Because they, they could have played both those churches there to set aside more than three cards if they wanted to. Uh, I think I would buy a second potion here and a church, maybe? Like, Brix's strategy is really relying on vineyards right now. And they, uh... They only have the one potion in their entire deck. So they instead bought a gold and an estate. That confuses me a lot. For example, why did they buy the commerce before the estate? <laughs> they want the gold, buying the estate first, and then buying the commerce would get you an extra gold for no added cost. Uh, don't know why. Also, why do they want more golds? Their strategy seems to be vineyards oriented, so you would think they would want more action cards, and neither gold nor estate is an action card. Uh, I don't know. It's a shame that most of the people who, like, do the self-commentary, like, explain their decision-making process, are the people who are, like, already very experienced at the game. Because I would really like to watch, like, some of the J-League players just explain their own thought process. Because sometimes I have a hard time 
guessing what they're thinking to like explain why it's off base. Like I couldn't tell you why they bought a potion and a copper turn four for the life of me. So I, I can't really explain exactly where the decision making has gone wrong except to say something went wrong there. Okay. Yeah, this is looking bad for Bricks now. I mean, it was looking bad for Bricks for a while. It looked like they had a glimmer of hope for a bit. But uh, now it's not looking like that again. <laughs> yeah, that is a very bad habit to get in. Where you're like, I've got seven money, so I need to spend exactly seven money. And so I'm going to buy something that costs exactly seven. Oh, well, I want to buy this $5 thing. Better buy a $2 thing just to feel like I've used all my money. And that's a real bad mindset to get in. The cards are priced for various reasons, but it's not the case that like a $5 card is just exactly 25% better than a $4 card, and a $6 card is exactly 50% better than a $4 card, such that just buying cards by their price value will always improve your deck quality. It is often the case that a much cheaper card is better than a much stronger card. For example, in a match I was just playing the other day, I think it was the one versus E Honda, the one with the, all the, the money from the tournament big money on the line. There was that uh, board where we both opened with two two-cost cards, where the, the best opening there was just to buy the page and the courtyard. Uh, even though those, those are both two, and we pass it up on threes and fours and whatnot, there's the best card for the deck. And that is you know, kind of frequently what you got to do, because the card that's best for you right now might not be the card that's just like generically the best, and so it might be priced differently uh, for other reasons. <laughs> so Capricorn's just got to score some amount of points here. It's by Duchy, because they're, you don't want to give Bricks like the outside chance of outscoring you by buying the last province. Yeah. Like there'd be some world where maybe Bricks ticks up their gardens points by playing a paddock and getting extra horses and then buys province and that could be enough. Uh, no, I don't think their deck can do 10 coins, or 10 points, or they have to do 11 points because they're player 1, so 11 points seems pretty hard. Hey, uh, is the potion still coming up? I don't even know. Well, in any case, uh, this ain't it. Two duchies? Could be a duchy and an action card. I'm not sure what they are in the vineyards points. Buy a church, another church, and a duchy. Okay. That seems all right. Dutch is worth points. Churches power up their vineyards. You can get behind that. Unfortunately, it looks like Capricorn's got the win in hand. Game one goes to player two. And now we go into game two. What do we have? Uh, this looks, oh, this looks strong. It's a nice little interaction. I wonder if either of them will pick up one. So we got all the requisite aspects. We got action in the form of throne room. We've got trashing with monastery. We've got buys with grand market, as well as gains with falconer. We got draw with laboratory or menagerie or catacombs. So you can build here. Now the thing that uh, sticks out to me is, what did I say? Woof, that felt messy. My apologies for dragging it up to an odd length. 
No, I mean, I've definitely seen matches where I'm just like, why the hell haven't they resigned yet? They do realize they're dead, right? That one, I thought they, they, they were losing the whole game. But they were like... Not so far that it was futile and like an obvious resign or anything. I think it was fair to play it out. Um, in any case, the combo that sticks out to me here is you got patron. If you got patron around, you want to look for things that cause you to reveal the card a bunch of times. Because if you can do that, you can just rack up a ton of money. And there's at least one card here that does that, which is Menagerie, which reveals your entire hand. So like imagine you just got a bunch of patrons in your hand and you just start playing Menagerie over and over. You get tons and tons of coffers for nothing. Are there any other cards that reveal anything? Catacombs feels like it might, but it says look at instead of reveal, which doesn't count. Because the difference between look at and reveal is only you need to see the cards if it says look at, whereas reveal is like show it to yourself and your opponent. Um, yeah, I think only Menagerie can reveal things. Um, yeah, so I would think you want to trash with Monastery, and then build a deck that plays a bunch of Menageries and Patrons. You'll add some Grand Markets for plus buy, most likely, and add in some Throne Rooms, a Laboratory or two, and all that's just going to be incredibly strong. And you should definitely be able to draw your deck pretty early. So how do you open? Uh, so Bricks has the 2-5, which is phenomenal. Uh, Monastery Falconer would be great. Monastery Labor Laboratory would be great. Uh, either of those. 4-3, I think you probably open Patron Monastery. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking Patron Monastery. If you if you build up some uh, villagers early by playing your Patron um, solo in terms where you don't play their action cards, then you could justify adding like a Catacombs rather than a lab Laboratory as your first draw card and just burn off those villagers for a bit. Uh, in any case, let's see how they actually opened. Brick! So oh, no! Oh no! So Bricks had a $2 turn, turn one, and elected to buy nothing rather than buy Monastery, which is the only trasher in this entire kingdom and something you absolutely have to get. Uh, they didn't get Falconer, and that's fine. Uh, Falconer's a reasonable card to get. But, whew, passing up a Monastery. The reason 5 2 is so good compared to 4 3 is just because. The, mo the most important card you want here costs two. In fact, I would even consider gaining a Monastery off of my Falconer, because then you get to trash two cards. Uh, because you would have both bought a card and gained a card in the name of the Monastery. And they plan to just not trash at all. Farmland's not really trashing. Uh, the reason is you... Like, let's say, best case scenario, you trash a useless card and turn it into a useful card. Like, you use Farmland to turn an estate into a, a throne room. So that on its own improves your deck quality. You've gotten one useless card of the deck. But then you replace it with a farmland, which is also a junk card. So you can't really use farmland to thin your deck, except in like weird cases like, I've got a watchtower in my hand, and so I can trash the farmland as it's coming in. But uh, I can't think of any kingdom where I've ever used farmland as a deck thinner. An upgrader. Well, if you had an upgrader, you'd already have a trasher in the kingdom, right? Like, if you had the, like, an upgrade and wanted to turn it into a king's court or a remodel, well, those are already good trashers. I don't think I've ever played a kingdom where, like, the key trashing was farmland and you actually, like, used it to trash. <laughs> Anyways, let me get caught up again. I didn't even look at uh, Capricorn's opening. Silver Patron, bleh. I mean, it's not bad, it helps you hit five, and the fives aren't bad, but I mean, you really want to get trashed. I, I really want, you know, Monastery early. I want to trash early. Capricorn's getting Menagerie. Maybe they see the, the Patron Menagerie interaction. I want to believe. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Gatekeeper has been bought. Yeah, Gatekeeper is uh, a card that is rarely worth buying. It's really weak. So, for starters, it has the same sort of problem that Raider does, the card we were discussing last game, where it gives you money, but it gives you money every other turn. So if you wanted to get three money every turn from Gatekeeper, you have to buy two Gatekeepers, play one one turn to get money the next turn, then play the other one the next turn instead of the following turn, and so forth. Uh, so it's like half as good as gold, which is already saying a lot. Uh, secondly, the attack is just not very strong. Every once in a while, it'll be pretty annoying. Like in black market games, it's really annoying because if they set the card aside that they bought from black market, there's no way to get that card back um, in most circumstances because 
there's only one card of each, uh, one copy of each card in the black market deck. But the vast majority of the time, all you're doing is at best like slightly delaying them. Like, oh no, I bought one grand market and I got exiled. I'll just buy another grand market next turn, and they get both of them back. And so it doesn't really hurt. And the problem, I mean, the main problem, most fundamentally, is if the card is weak, it also costs five, so it's trading off with the ability to buy a better card, like Falconer, or Laboratory, or Catacombs, all of which seem like strong fives. I would love to have any of those in the deck. And so if I'm buying Gatekeeper, the biggest problem, just at its core, is I'm not giving the other cards, which are really good. And so that's a problem. <laughs> Rick's getting that coffer off of the Patreon Menagerie interaction. Here is an interesting context where the farm link can make sense. Which is if you want a throne room anyway, but it's fair, it's a good card. You could buy the throne room outright. Or you could do the upgrade estate into throne room with farmland. Again, either way, you get one junk card in your deck. Um, so it hasn't changed that on its own. But it does mean you've technically gained one more card this turn, and so now your monastery can trash two cards instead of one. So now trash both those coppers. Play the monastery, trash two coppers. One. No, I was, I was just explaining why the, the farmland buy was so good. It lets you trash a second copper. Wait, why did they buy farmland then? It reminds me of that scene in Pirates of the Caribbean two, where Jack Sparrow is like, "I love those moments. I like to wave at them as they pass me by." Like Brick's just really wanted the opportunity to be able to trash the copper and be like, no, I don't trash coppers. That's not how I do it here. <laughs> yeah, these, these names are, are relatively simple, I would think. Uh, there's not a whole lot of room for ambiguity. Bricks? Bricks? Yeah, that doesn't seem plausible. 2020 seems clear enough. Capricorn? I guess there could be some ambiguity as to, to where the emphasis is in Capricorn's name, given the non-standard capitalization. Like, do you just pronounce it Capricorn, like normal, or is it Capricorn? Do you, have, do you yell the corn? Uh, Capricorn? Who knows? I <laughs> Typing out their name doesn't clarify to me at all how you're <laughs> suggesting I pronounce it. Um, oh, no. So we have a province by which is generally a bad sign. I'm going to guess that when I watch, like, you know, low-level league games, like I-League and J-League, and 90-plus percent of the time, the first province buy of the game would be me going, oh, no, why they buy province so early? And just most of the time in most kingdoms, there's room to build big. And most of the time, if you just cut and run and start buying provinces early, one at a time, you end up, shortchanging yourself because you never have a, a big functional deck that lets you buy a lot of the provinces. And so it's almost always a mistake to buy province the first turn you can buy province. You usually want to keep building until you can buy multiple provinces, or at least so you can reliably buy province every turn, that sort of thing. Capri corn. Bricks does have menagerie and patron stuff, which is a nice little interaction. I mean, that's, that's the one I kind of wanted to build my deck around, for the most part. It's just like, Menageries and Patrons are a great payload. But I mean, there's so much stuff you could be doing here. Lots of Grand Markets, you could throw in room of Grand Markets. Plenty of draw. Such a strong kingdom. Uh, yeah, the... Buying gold is just bad. It's real bad. Always. Not always, but usually. Yeah. <laughs> DZ asking a relevant question. So, I was commenting, I was like, you know what a really strong combo is here? Menagerie Patron. Oh, look what Bricks is doing. <laughs> Menagerie Patron. But that only works if you play Menagerie Patron, not Patron Menagerie. <laughs> the way that works is 
if you have the patron in hand and you play the menagerie, you r reveal your hand and then get free coffers off of the patron for every menagerie you play. If you play the, the patron first and then play the menagerie, that doesn't happen because there's no patron in hand anymore. Um, so now I'm suddenly a little bit more stumped as to why they have menageries and patrons in their deck if it wasn't for that combination. Okay, they got five here. It could be more if they wanted to. Like, you could just spend two and buy a Grand Market. That's fine. Um, I think buying a five would have also been fine. Like, Catacombs, I think, would probably be the best for them. They have a bajillion villagers. They are no need of action, so I'd take the Terminal Draw Card Catacombs over, like, the Simple Laboratory. So, Menagerie is a really strong card. Like, even setting aside the, the patron combo, uh, Menagerie is just really good, right? At its height, it is like two laboratories in one for 60% of the cost of a single laboratory. Because, you know, you're drawing three cards instead of two, which is net two cards instead of net one card. But Menagerie is fantastic. What's the problem? Well, you have to have one copy of each thing in your hand. And so it plays very poorly with your starting coppers and estates, because you have a bunch of copies of those, and they clog up your deck, and your Menagerie can't draw. So if you want Menageries, which they seem to, because they're getting a bunch of them, then you would also presumably want to trash all your coppers and estates as quickly as possible. And neither of them seems to think that that's a very high priority in this game. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a consistent trend throughout these games, based on this game and the previous one is I think they severely undervalue how important and valuable it is to trash all your starting cards. Like, what's a good analogy? Like, imagine I have three golds in my deck, and I just want to use those three golds to buy a province every turn. And I've got ten junk cards that I started with. To reliably draw all three golds on top of those ten junk cards, let's say I've got, like, two provinces already from the golds I bought. If I had no junk cards, at three golds and two provinces, I would need no amount of draw. And if I had like two, three golds and three provinces, I would need like one draw. I need to have like three golds, three provinces, and a lab. Now imagine I haven't trashed my coppers and my estates. My deck now has not six cards in it, but like 16 in it. So now I need 10 laboratories just to be able to find those golds. Uh, all of a sudden, that's an incredibly high burden. Basically, every copper and estate in your deck uh, means you need one more draw power in your deck to get through your deck because you're going to have to draw that copper every single time you shuffle your deck and shuffle the copper back in. Well, Laboratory is an expensive card. It's a five-cost card, and it draws you one card. I mean, it says plus two cards, but it itself takes up one spot. So it on net draws you one card. So you have to like buy it, an extra Laboratory for like every copper in your deck and every estate in your deck. Now imagine Monastery. It's a two-cost card. Every time you play it, you're trashing at least one copper in a state. So imagine Monastery just said, like, gain one laboratory for every card you've gained this turn. That would sound phenomenal. That's basically what the card is. Uh, and you'd want to buy it early, and you'd want to play it often to get all those free laboratory effects. And they're going to keep greening. I guess at this point it makes sense because Province is already so low. But provinces should not be so low yet when they don't have a handle in the deck. <laughs> yeah, Pro Proteus is a good point. They have identified that Grand Market is a good card. And they're like, yeah, no, no, no. One is enough for me. I don't want to overdo it. I'm, I'm watching my weight. <laughs> I don't want to get my <laughs> too bloated in my deck. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hold off at a single Grand Market. Wouldn't want to have too many buys or too much money. That would just be... That would be extravagant. Oh, this is a risky play. Capricorn taking the penultimate province. You should definitely buy a state now. You've committed to buying that province. Um, you are likely to win if your opponent doesn't win this turn. But you put yourself in a dicey spot. So, Bucks, uh, Bricks now needs to hit nine how much do they need to hit just nine right they got it in hand you just buy a farmland and turn your gold into a province and then you win even if they don't find that play they can also just buy province duchy outright 
And I'm sure they'll find that. Why Menagerie? You have the win in hand. Did they not see that? Sure, they they can't not find the win. Like if you just sort of click the most basic cards while I'm clicking the situation, you would win inadvertently. Like oh, there's one province left. Let me click on that. Oh, I've got plenty of money left. Let me click on the next most expensive victory card. What are they thinking about? Like this isn't one where the math is exceptionally close. You need nine money, and you have. What? 18 money. <laughs> like, you could do like a little Fermi calculation and be like, okay, I'm overshooting here a bunch. Uh-oh. Okay, maybe it's like a Wi-Fi issue? Looks like they got some connection problems? That could explain it. All right, Briggs, you can do this. Okay, they're not playing their coppers for some reason. Not that they need the coppers. <laughs> I sure hope they don't buy Grand Market here. <laughs> this does look suspiciously like someone trying to buy Grand Market. <laughs> okay, come on. Just buy the province. <laughs> this is so much more stressful than it needs to be. Farm landing copper into the state is a real fancy way to score exactly as many points as just buying a duchy outright would have scored you. Uh, Brix's play is very enigmatic, to say the least. They like to keep the element of surprise, keep the audience on their toes. Oh boy, a lot going on here. So the trashing is develop, and that's it. Oof. So Mountebank's going to be real strong here. Not Magpie, Mountebank. Um, it's a strong attack. It's actually one of the best cards in the game. Probably top five, because it... What's 1-1-4? One, one, Are they saying, like... Each of them has won once, and there's four to go. I guess that's what they mean. That would be correct. Um, anyways, Mountebank gives a, a curse and a copper, and it gives you two coins. So imagine you're trying to get trashed. Every one time they play a Mountebank, you need to play develop twice. And each one time they do that, they're getting two money, whereas you're getting no money. So the, the junking power here of Mountebank kind of strongly overpowers the thinning power of all the rest of the cards because there's only one trasher and it's not particularly strong relative to Mountebank's power. So definitely your goal here is to get up to Mountebank and uh, attack them a lot. Now you do have a draw. Alchemist draws, Her Herald sometimes draws, Magpie draws, Faithful Hound draws, although it's terminal and the actions here aren't amazing. The sorts of action, I mean. You do have some action. Herald is action if it hits. Um, which in a deck that's not that's not fully trashed is going to be unreliable because you might hit coppers and curses a lot, but it's not a bad card. And royal carriage is draw, or not draw. Royal carriage is uh, action because it lets you play an action card an extra time without having to spend an action on it. So royal carriage is like a village effect in nature, for the same reason that throne room is. So how do you open here? A lot of viable options. I think I would open magpie improve. Um, Magpie is a, a really good card to open with. Magpie on its own is, like, the, the card itself is, like, reasonably good. It's a cantrip that sometimes draws you a card if that card's a treasure. Which, I mean, not every deck has a lot of treasures, but 
it's more or less a no risk gamble. Uh, the reason why Magpie is such a strong opener, though, is because like magpies gain more than more of themselves, and so if you buy one magpie and your opponent doesn't, your one magpie is going to turn into like ten magpies pretty fast because they're going to gain more magpies and so forth, and so you kind of got to open magpie early most of the time to contest the magpie split, and so I want to do that, and then the fours I think are better than the threes, and so I often like opening improve when I'd really rather have two fours. Like you play it as its silver effect once. And you just turn it straight into a four, like Magpie or Herald, or maybe even Potion. Uh, rather than opening silver, where you're then stuck with a silver. Improves like a silver that becomes a four cost card after the first time you play it. So, Brix opens with Magpie and Merchant. That's a curious combination, given that Merchant's value comes from there being silvers in your hand. And uh, Brix's deck has no silvers at the moment. Not really sure why they wanted the merchant there, but uh, all right. Capricorn opens Magpie Silver. That just seems very strictly worse than Magpie Improve. Uh, another argument, I think, in Improve's favor is you actually... I like opening Magpie and not a treasure early because it increases Magpie's chance of failing to draw. Right? You have... Uh, rather than having... Eight treasures and three non-treasures in your deck, you have seven treasures and four non-treasures, which is a better odds. And early on, realistically, you'd rather your magpie not draw. You'd, you'd rather it hit an action or victory card and gain you an extra magpie. Because that gets that snowball effect rolling faster. And then late in the game, you're happy for magpie draws. Uh-oh. Did Corn get the double sombrero? Or the golden sombrero? Yeah, that's real unfortunate. Uh, so I don't even know exactly why it's called a golden sombrero. That's a term in a baseball for like when you strike out, what, like four times in a row in a game. Um, but a Dominion, it means you bought two cards in the opening, like turn one and turn two, and then turn three and turn four, you drew none of the cards you bought. Which, uh, if you think about it statistically, you have ten cards at the start. If you buy one card turn one, one card turn two, and then shuffle your deck, you have twelve cards. And so you're going to draw five of those cards turn three, five more turn four. So exactly two cards are going to miss that shuffle, um, assuming that you don't like draw draw cards or something like that. And so what are the odds that exactly those two cards that missed the shuffle are exactly the two cards that you bought, you know, the two cards of value, and you just draw all your coppers in the states a second time? And the answer is 1 in 66, at least in a standard game, without you know, wonky opening uh, contingencies. And so every 33 or so games, I guess, I don't know exactly the math, but like every so often you'll see someone in a game have this golden sombrero situation where both of their buys miss the shuffle, and it usually sucks a whole lot. Because <laughs> chances are those cards that you bought are the only cards of value in your deck, and you didn't get to see them. Okay, so someone has a mount bank. Who is that? Gains a mount bank. Okay. Uh, oh, where'd it, where'd it go? It was Capricorn. Bought it. Uh, turn five. I like that. Mount bank's good. Capricorn then bought a treasury. I like that less. Again, I just want to play Mountebank a whole bunch of times. I think you could buy a second Mountebank outright. I think perhaps even better is buying a Royal Carriage. You could call the Royal Carriage on the Mountebank to play it twice per shuffle. And if you see them both in the same hand, you're not sad because you can play them both, whereas you couldn't play two Mountebanks. So I think I'd prefer a Royal Carriage, but even double Mountebank would be fine. Treasury is just like a mediocre card. It's not bad or anything, but again, it's got that problem of it costs five, and so you have to be really good to justify costing five because you're trading off with buying other things like Royal Carriage and Mountain Bank, which are just better. Brix is going for Alchemist. Wait, 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 what? I'm confused. They just, they just bought Silver over Alchemist. Like, they had the potion. They played the potion, and they bought Silver. Ah, uh, ha, 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 Why? Why would you want... I mean, they are also buying an excess of merchants for some reason. And so maybe they're trying to justify their their merchants. I mean, realistically, you shouldn't have had the merchants in the first place. But at this point, it's kind of a sub sunk cost. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would take an alchemist, no question, over a silver. It's like a laboratory that also often top decks itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So Capricorn now has their second mountebank to Brix's zero. I'm going to say Capricorn wins this game. I think this... Yeah, it's definitely not too early to call it. Brix hit five and has bought a no treasury. This game is over. Um, I'm going to eat some green beans now. Like the next game. Hmm. Eat your veggies, kids. You'll grow up to be strong. Mm. Oh, look at that. It was brutal. I should censor this out. That's just painful looking. They've got four more junk cards in their deck in one turn. Now, like, think about what these alchemists have done for you. You first have to buy a potion, which is one extra junk card. Then you buy an alchemist, which gives you one draw. So the first alchemist is basically just like neutralizing the potion. Then you buy a second alchemist. You now added one draw to your deck. In one turn, your opponent has added four junk cards. It's so like negative four draw, which is four times as much as that whole alchemist-related excursion has gotten you thus far. Yeah, the, the mountebank thing is just going to destroy anything else. Oh no. Oh god. No. Please don't buy gold. The problem with gold is it's not mountebank. And it's not something that helps you play mountebank. And it's, it's a junk card that gets in the way of you playing mountebank. <laughs> That's a good point. Even if you wanted a gold, you could have just buy, bought Reap, which gets you a gold and also plays it for you for free the very next turn. <laughs> which they didn't want to do they just were like I only want the gold to be in my deck I don't want to actually play it um, the reasoning for that is less than clear I don't think any theory is going to explain Briggs' decisions. <laughs> this person makes the most peculiar buys of any person I've ever seen. Like, I've seen people who do things that are, like, less strategic. Like, i watched players who thought they needed to use, like, every one of their buys, so when they had extra buys, they would like, buy coppers. Like, tons and tons of coppers. And that's worse. But it at least follows a consistent pattern. Briggs is just an agent of chaos. <laughs> No, I think it might have been recorded even. I definitely watched a game not that long ago. A few months ago, but less than a year. Where there was a player who was buying coppers at the end of every turn. It could have been maybe that they just thought coppers were good. And it wasn't like a, oh, I'm compelled by the rules to buy coppers. I just really want all the coppers. But I just remember getting <laughs> very, very frustrated at the number of coppers that were getting bought that game. Well, that match it wasn't even like a single game. Like, oh, there's like fountain on the board. Let me buy a bunch of coppers. I wonder why Bricks doesn't have auto top deck one. So there's this long wait at the end of each of Bricks' turns, and that's because it's prompting them to ask like, whether they want to top deck the alchemist or not. The answer to which is, yeah, duh. Um, but they seem to give it a long think every turn anyway. The easy solution is, if you're a player and you right-click alchemist, it's not showing up for me because I'm not a player, but if you right-click alchemist, it'll have like, a little button here that's like, always top deck. And you can click that, and then you'd never have to go through that little extra thingamajig at the end. It just automatically top decks it for you. In fact, um, you can manually turn it on each game by right-clicking Alchemist and like pressing the button. Or you can just go into your settings, and there's like a setting for auto top deck, and you click it in the settings, and it always has that option on by default for you. And it's never any risk. Like if you draw a, a kingdom where you happen to want to not not top deck Alchemists, which is occasionally the case, uh, you can like manually turn it back off in the middle of the game 
doing the right foot thing anyway. <clears throat> On the one hand, that is remarkably long for the magpie to not hit. But uh, they also have a lot of treasures. <laughs> Oops, someone's unmuted. Um, it's the name I always struggle to pronounce. The long sequence of vowels in the D. A your mic is on. So, we're 13 turns in, and Brix does not have a mount to bank. So, this is looking about as over as before, but I am unfortunately almost out of green beans. Please don't buy silver. Oh, a lot of these names stump me. <laughs> what, what you get is my best guess, <laughs> not my educated guess. <laughs> All right, Bricks has a lot of alchemists. but nothing in their deck worth drawing to. Wait a second. Capricorn has played their Mountebank remarkably few times. Yes, Minion Pawn, this is in fact a league match. This is J-League. Yeah. I mean, even, like, just Mountebank alone is enough to make this game unwinnable for Bricks. The fact that Capricorn has Mountebank and Bricks does not. But beyond that, Capricorn's play, I think, has not been particularly effective. Like, you've got the Mountebanks. Now your goal is to play them as much as possible. I'd be adding lots of draw cards. Maybe Alchemist? not and then like Harold would be good and maybe even adding some trashers like maybe add a develop and turn the estates into merchants or something it's worth considering royal carriage Rick's is just gonna buy every five dollar card except for the mountain bank their deck has alchemist merchant magpie Royal Carriage, Treasury, Develop. Are they the one who got the Improve? No, that was that was Capricorn. Capricorn. No, they're not a pacifist because they bought that Raider when they shouldn't have. They, they, they were willing to buy attacks, even when those attacks are not actually good for their deck. I believe it's 1-1 one, one at the moment. Yeah, Gatekeeper as well, good point. And <laughs> it's easy to forget the gatekeeper actually counts as an attack because of how weak it is. Um, is it possible? I would not guess that it's possible at this point. Like, the damage is kind of already done. The curses and coppers have been given. Ooh, 2 plus potion. This late in the game, that is painful but not necessarily unpredictable. Okay, surely you want to turn that Improve into a four cost card, right? I'll get a Herald or a Magpie or something. I think I'll take a Herald. Magpie would be good too.
I guess they're deciding which. I don't have a super strong opinion of which is better. They decide neither. Okay then. Just gonna stick with the unimproved improve. Another one plus potion hand. This is what happens when you don't trash your cards and give your opponent uncontested access to the cursor. Ah, Faithful Hound. <laughs> That's really what the deck needs. I mean, to be fair, what are you going to buy on two? Like, is Faithful Hound better than nothing? Probably. They don't really have a whole lot of other terminal actions in the deck because they refuse to buy a mount bank. Um... It's going to be another province for uh, Capricorn. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, they still need to draw a copper, don't they? Not that unlikely. Oh, no, they got it for sure because they have a royal carriage. Yeah, I would say uh, maybe call the royal carriage on the mountain bank. Not sure whether you want to save it for next turn or call it now. Probably call it now and get an extra attack. Oh, yeah, this is very much Capricorn's game. Capricorn is in the Ascendant at the moment. Cap. That's why it's corn, as in capital. I'm not, I'm not following you there. Clue me in a little bit further, panda bear guy. Cap, Capricorn. I don't think the cap in Capricorn means capitalize. I imagine it's someone whose astrological sign is Capricorn and who also just really likes corn. Or maybe... It's a new experimental flavor of Capri Sun. Now Capri Corn. They've, they've tried all sorts of fruit flavors, and now they're branching into the vegetable market to compete with V8. Or maybe like the Ban Corn. That's called the K, isn't it? That's K. Never mind. Not that one. That is true. But not the co you think. It's actually the second co that stands for corn. <laughs> and let me tell you roughly when the resign button looked tempting. Uh, when is the first time bricks hit five? Okay, took him took him a while. Okay, probably sooner. Um, oh Jesus Christ, it took ages. By turn nine, Bricks definitively could have resigned because that was the, the turn they made clear they had no intention of getting Mountain Bank. Hey, you buy and gain treasury, and you're like, all right, that was a mistake. Let me resign. Um, probably before that even it was over because like Capricorn already had a Mountain Bank, had already gotten their Royal Carriage and their second Mountain Bank. The game was, was pretty much unlocked even before Bricks hit five. Uh, I think that's right. That's 2-0 for player two so far. That big second player advantage is weird in its head. First player advantage seems a lot smaller in lower level games. I think it's because the games last longer, and so that one extra turn is diluted. 
you know, like one extra turn in a 25 turn game like this one is, is less meaningful than a one extra turn in an eight turn game or something. But I, I haven't noticed a substantial a first player advantage in these. The FPA here stands for Forget Potion Advantage. Capricorn went straight for the Mountebank, and uh, Bricks got a bajillion potions, and consequently did not hit five. To be fair, once they hit five, they also did not buy Mountebank. <laughs> but uh, the, the potions themselves had already, I think, doomed this game to a loss even before that. Yeah, it's not a great ratio. Like, again, each Alchemist basically only covers one potion. So... They've bought five cards, three alchemists and two potions, to add one total draw to their deck. Province. This is so frequent. I, I've been noticing this in like all the J League games I've been covering lately. Is they will refuse to resign. They won't go anywhere near the resign button ever. But they will happily fall on the sword and resign by any other indirect means like buy the last province or three pile themselves or whatever. They, they, they will do that as the, the moment you give them the opportunity. But press the resign button? Uh, I guess maybe there's some perceived stigma, uh, like resigning is bad sportsmanship, but buying the last province is not. I'm not totally sure why that is the case, but that seems to be a pretty commonly held view in my experience. I would think as soon as you know that you can't win the game, like here roughly around turn four, um, you just click the resign button and you're like, all right, good game, let's get on to the next one, not waste our times. Alrighty, so it is now two, one, four, Capricorn. Going into game four, what do we have here? So the only trashing is expand, which is awkward because expand is expensive. But Sinister Plot could be a good way to get there early. I think you'd really want to open Plot. 4-3 looks better than 3-4 here. Um, do we have 4-3? I can't tell. Looks like Brooks is having some internet trouble. Uh, anyways, where do we go from there? Yeah, I think you want to get Sinister Plot ASAP, pop it on an opportune moment to get 7 early, and then Expand will be pretty nice here because you can turn this estate into 5 costs, which looks nice. There's only one buy, though, uh, so you're pretty limited in that regard means expand will be key. You might even get a cobbler for extra gains. No, probably not. Grave Harbor is probably better for gains. But you got villages with bazaar or encampment. You got draw with encampment, oracle, swashbuckler, or wild hunt. You can build pretty big here. Fairgrounds is an extra stack of points. Colonies around, wild hunt is points. You want to build real, real big. So on 4-3, so Bricks is the better opening because they get to open plot turn one, which means you get one extra draw compared to opening plot turn two. I would think Plot Vassal uh, would be my preferred opening. Plot Oracle sounds fine. Plot Silver sounds fine. I think if I'm just adding the one card, I would rather add a card that gives money over a card that gives draw. Because for this early moment in the game, right, the average value of the other cards in your deck is like 0.7 money. Because you got seven coppers and three estates. And so drawing two cards is giving you like expected value 1.4 money. A little higher than that with Oracle because you can you know selectively skip estates and whatnot. A little higher. Um, but the best it could do would be two money. And uh, Vassal can hit two. Silver can hit two. And so I'd rather add that. Uh, now if you're, if you're buying two cards, sometimes you might buy like Oracle plus Silver. Because uh, Oracle's going to be better for your deck longer term. Now where is this early plot plot? Ah, uh, pop, plot, pop. That's a tongue twister. Plot, pop. Uh, yeah, turn four. I don't like that. Not at all. The, uh, asking whether someone's back seems like a little bit of a, of a futile question. <laughs> because if they're not back, they are, they're not going to answer you. Um, Yeah. I would think you want to save up the plot for a few turns and wait till you think you can hit 7 to pop it because I really, really want an expand in my deck. Six is an awkward number. I guess just, I don't know, bizarre. 
Wild Hunt. Fairground? What? What? Bricks, I don't understand you. What? What goes on in this fella's head? Man. <laughs> I want to make a series of puzzles that are just like, guess what guard Bricks bought in this situation? And post that in the puzzles channel and see if anyone can score greater than zero. <laughs> because, oh boy. Why would you why would you buy fairgrounds? <laughs> but why would you buy province there? You could buy province for six it'd still be a terrible buy. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, if you bought expand, which you can't, because you just filled your deck with junk. Okay, let me talk about why this is bad. Uh, there's a lot of reasons. The first is you're passing up on all the really good cards. You got um, action and money with Bizarre. You got draw with Wild Hunt or Swashbuckler, and gains with Cobbler. Most of these cards would be real nice additions to your deck. So buying Fairground means you're not buying that. Secondly, it's a junk card. It's actively making your deck worse. Fairground is a stop card that you're putting in your deck. Every single time that Brick shuffles the deck for the rest of the game, they are shuffling a Fairgrounds into it, which does nothing for them. So they have sort of hobbled their deck for the remainder of their game. Now what's the upside of Fairgrounds? It's worth a few points. But that sort of cumulative harm of hurting their deck uh, for the rest of the game and also pack passing up on a card that would have helped their deck for the rest of the game is just going to far dwarf whatever short-term points Fairgrounds is giving you. Like, you're going to lose by multiple colonies because you just decimated your deck by buying that paragraph. Look at this hand. Look at this hand. This is what happens when you don't build one copper. <laughs> a single copper. <laughs> they buy colony. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, exact same thing applies to colony. <laughs> don't buy the colony. The colony is bad for your deck. You are destroying your deck's quality. And now it... Now you're hitting one. You literally are hitting one. Eight turns into the game because all you've done is buy green cards. Oh, oh man. That is that is egregious. This seems like a classic case of like just do not buy the most expensive card you can. It is not necessarily the best card for your deck. And in by no stretch of the imagination when I I even contemplate buying province or colony there or fairgrounds the previous turn. It's just like not a thing that should even be on your radar until you've trashed all your junk cards, you've started drawing your deck, you've added payload, and you're like, all right, maybe now, like turn 14 or so in this kingdom, I can start scoring. Whew. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> this, this roller coaster of events and Brix's buys has distracted me. Let me look at what Capricorn's been doing. Okay, so they got, oh no, they bought gold. Gold turn six. I mean, it's not fairgrounds bad, but it's it's pretty bad. <laughs> Look at these action cards, look at these draw cards, look at this trasher. Oh man, there's so... Oh yeah, Capricorn could have had Swashbuckler turn 6. Not Swashbuckler, they could have had Expand turn 6. Because they had Coffers and they had Gold. Instead, they're getting it turn 10, which is much slower. They then bought Platinum, which is... That's... Meh. I would rather Expand over Platinum. Trashing is just way too important. They could have had to Expand turn 6... Turn seven, turn eight, turn nine, and instead they get it turn ten. They've had multiple expands by now. Second expand here, I would think. Meanwhile, Brix is over there buying silver because their deck is really bad. <laughs> that would be hilarious if Capricorn was like, oh shoot, my opponent's got province or colony already. Uh, time to resign. Now, I mean, my thought process is exactly the reverse. It's like, I, I get in these situations where, like, you'll be playing someone who's much lower rated, and then you have, like, some poor shuffle luck, and you're, like, really far down come, like, turn 7 or turn 8, and you're like, shoot, I'm about to lose hella rating points, because this player who's much lower is going to win. And you're like, all I have to do is, like, play it reasonably well, and I'm toast. And then you see them by province, and you're like, oh, thank the Lord. And <laughs> they forfeited the game. Like, buying province earlier, in this case colony earlier, is just, like, so incredibly bad. 
Uh, Keldar, your uh, Discord mic is unmuted. Oh, sorry. No problem. Okay. So, Capricorn. Who has the second expand now? Okay, then expand. Okay, so he has two expands. I like that. I think two is probably enough. I don't think you need a third one. Uh, I don't know that I want a bunch of Platinums, though. Platina. I think the plural is Platina. Platinums. I feel like those are both probably fine. Uh, I think maybe maybe one Platinum for the money. Uh, but Platina. Okay. But like, there's not a need to have a lot of money here because there's no plus buy. And so the maximum money you could ever conceivably need to have is 11 to buy a single colony on your turn. And if you build a, a decent deck, you'll be drawing every card in your deck anyway. And a lot of those cards will be bazaars, and you'll get money off of that. You'll probably have a few untrashed coppers. And so you won't need multiple platina to be hitting 11. Maybe late in the game you might need to add like a second one, maybe. <sighs> yeah, why does Bricks have no bazaars? <laughs> People keep asking me, like, why does Bricks blank? And the answer is always, I have no idea. This this fellow's mind is a black box to me. I, I could not remotely predict what they're thinking. Look at all these draw cards that they cannot play because they have no actions. They do have a colony and a uh, fairgrounds that they're revealing. Imagine if those were cards of value. Yeah, so the way this game ought to have gone is you get Sinister Plot early, you wait a few turns, you pop it, you get Expand. Then the first thing you're doing is you're expanding those estates into action and draw cards. Like you want wild hunts, you want swashbucklers and bazaars and so forth. And then once you get those up and running, then you, you draw your deck, you get a second expand in there at some point, I would think. And you're trashing your estates, you get rid of those, you trash the coppers into vassals or encampments, probably encampments best. Uh, maybe at some point you could turn in turn like one of those like your early silver or something into a gold. Or your vassal, if you open with that, turn that into a gold to reveal with encampment. And then, as you're after you're drawing your deck a bunch, then you start buying colony, and you'll eventually be able to do like two or three colonies in a turn because you'll be able to like expand your platinum into colony or whatever in the last turn. Capricorn gains a duchy. Why would one do that? <laughs> Where we're going, we very much do need bazaars. We just don't have them. Grave robber. Does Bricks have that many action cards? Is there stuff in the trash? Not sure what they're. Why grave robber? Are they... <laughs> Grave Robber starts with a GR. It's like a green card. Are they, they're, they're powering up their singular fairgrounds. I mean, that could be it. Hmm. At any point in any of these games, have either of them ever drawn their entire decks? Because we've seen, the Mountain to Bank game aside, a decent number of strong engine kingdoms. Did Bricks draw their deck? What was that? <laughs> oh, are we talking about when they pop their sinister plot this one time? <laughs> okay, so the... the the, the one turn this entire game had happened was the, the, the colony buy. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I count this. Um, boy. <laughs> I guess it does technically meet the requirements for what I was asking for, though. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, again, uh, I've said this before, and it, it does seem really basic, but it seems like it's worth emphasizing for these folks, is... In the majority of kingdoms where it's possible, which this kingdom was possible, game one was possible, game two was possible, game three, or which one is Mountebank? Game four. Game four, maybe not so much because Mountebank's just such a strong attack, but almost every one of these other kingdoms, you can easily build a deck 
that draws its entire deck and plays all of its cards every turn. And if you can do that, you usually should do that, because it's generally the strongest deck type. And so the, the operative goal should be, how do I do that? And the answer should be, step one, trash the bad cards. Step two, add draw cards. Step three, do everything else. They keep skipping straight to step three without doing steps one and two. And so we see in every one of these games, they severely undervalue trashing, and then their decks just never go anywhere because they're full of junk. Trashed that copper into encampment, I would think. Honestly, you could probably just... Uh, no, I mean, maybe just turn the platinum into colony now is better. Like, they're already, with only four colonies left, you could just double colony here and be fine. And, like, I, I'm thinking about what I would be doing. Like, oh, I've still got coppers left. I should be trashing those and building a deck. But they have not done that. And at this point, it's probably too late to do that. So I think, I, well, <laughs> that is not... Not what I was thinking. Um, why silver? Silver is about as bad for your deck as copper is. Encampment seems so much better. <laughs> yeah, I, I was stressing how important the uh, expand was. But <laughs> these are not the reasons for which expand is important. If you're turning coppers into silvers with expand, it's basically even worse than mine. Because mine, the, you know, the $5 base card, turns coppers into silvers and puts the silver street back into your hand. And it only costs five, and it's still one of the worst cards in the game. So that is not a particularly valuable use of expand. You want expand because it can reduce the number of stop cards in your deck. The reason mine is so weak is because it never makes your deck any thinner. It turns one stop card, a copper, into another stop card, a silver. It can turn that silver into a gold, but at the end of the day, you're still, uh, you still have 10 junk cards in your deck. And now an 11th one because you've added a mine. The benefit of expand is you can turn those treasures and stuff into non-treasure cards, uh, like action cards. You can turn your estates into bazaars for action. You can turn your coppers into encampment for action and draw. You can turn your estates into wild hut. You can turn your coppers into vassal, into oracle, whatever, and get cards that actually kick your deck off. And, uh, well, they ain't doing that. In any case, I mean, Capricorn's gonna win anyway, because <laughs> that, that Fairgrounds and Colony, man, that is like... <laughs> That's have to, like, click on the resign button in, in all but actuality. All right. I feel like Bricks can see the writing on the wall here, right? Like, I think they're just morally opposed to hitting the resign button. I'm pretty sure if they were to hit 11 this turn, they would buy the colony. Maybe so. I mean, like, they're, they're real far behind at that point, but it, having 2020 vision, heh, pun intended, unintended, actually. I'm, I'm lying to say that was intended. Um, having 2020 vision. Uh, Capricorn severely underplayed that kingdom from th that point onwards, so maybe it's possible to come back from that. Alright, so that was... Shoot, I've lost track of the score now. <laughs> Does someone remember what the score was? It was 1-1 one, one after game 2, and I've forgotten since. Is it... I'm going to guess 4-1 for Capricorn? 3-1 for Corn. Oh, is that game 4? Oh, yeah. I, I'm terrible at remembering the score. All right. Uh, let's talk about this game. So we got uh, Trashing. Well, we got Goat because Pixie's in the kingdom. Then it means you'll also start with a Goat in lieu of one of your coppers. So you can start Trashing right out of the gates. There's also Sanctuary, which is sort of de facto Trashing because it lets you exile cards, which just means setting them aside permanently. And then, theoretically, Pixie can trash if you happen to draw the uh, the flames gift boon 
You can pop Pixie and trash two cards. Taxman, in the most like technical of senses, it does say the word trash. We don't count Taxman. Taxman sucks. Just forget that it exists. Because it has that same problem with mine I was discussing a second ago. Is it trashes the treasure and then gives you a treasure back. Not only does it give you a treasure back, it puts it on the top of your deck. So it doesn't make your deck any thinner and just it puts stop cards in the way. So Taxman is, is pretty terrible. Yeah, I sure hope they don't have been Fortress or Taxman. Um... Verjok has a point. If you were to lower the pile such that there were no coppers or silvers left, and then trash a copper with Taxman, you would successfully reduce the number of cards in your deck because there would be nothing left to gain. So if you wanted to take that route, uh, that is perhaps one of the best case uses of Taxman. Um, so we got, we got good trashing. We got plus buy with Festival or Sanctuary. Or, I mean, I guess Nomad Camp, but Nomad Camp's just worse. Uh, Haggler's also good at gaining cards. So, plenty of gains. We've got Actions with Festival and Fortress. we got Draw with Seer and Patrol. You could do the Minion Draw to X thing, but I think that's worse than just Standard Draw with the other cards here. I think I'd be playing with, like, Patrol and Seer as my main draw. Uh, there's also Way of the Otter around, which makes any card potentially draw. Way of the Otter makes me kind of want to load up a little bit more on Villages than I normally would, like Festival and Fortress, because if I draw them, um, I could just play them as, as Otter anyway. Actually, as I say that, honestly, Fortress would not even be the ne necessarily the worst opening ever here. I mean, again, not because, like, Fortress itself has any value, but because, like, you could play this way the Otter, which would be fine. Um, so I, I, I could even see opening Fortress, actually. Like, Pixie Fortress could be defensible. Um, yeah, I think I'm fine with that. I think on 4-3, I would open with Nomad Camp, because you have that plus buy. And either you hit five, which is nice, you can buy like Sanctuary or something, or you hit four and you buy two Pixies, which is also nice. So I think on 4-3, I really like Nomad Camp as my preferred opening. Uh, Bricks goes for Wedding. Uh, this this is bad. Um, in Dominion, we are Catholic priests. We do not do weddings. Uh, we, we stay... Uh, what's the opposite of being married? Bachelors? Not a good word for that. Just don't get this. It's not, it's not that strong. Um... The problem is you're basically buying a gold, and buying gold is bad. You just don't buy golds. Um, there's action cards to be had here. There's things to be built. Gold is actively getting in your way of that. Um, Capricorn gets Nomad Camp. I like that. I like that a lot better. Bricks does nothing turn two because they wasted your turn one buying a wedding. Uh-oh. Capricorn turn two bought a minion. I don't... I, oh, no. It gets worse. It gets worse. Capricorn's buying treasures. Oh, no. They, oh, no. Oh, no. And I... No. <laughs> oh. Okay, so what I was going to say initially when I first saw the minion buy was, oh no, minion's not that good. But like, you could build a passable minion deck here, where you play a lot of minions uh, for the money, and you add in some like festivals and stuff, and maybe like a haggler or a nomad camp or two. And the idea is, you have a hand that's like festival, nomad camp, minion or something like that. You play a festival, you play a nomad camp, you play a minion. You discard, you draw four more cards. You play your extra festivals, your extra nomad camps, your minions, your hagglers, then discard again, draw four more cards. And you keep drawing through, and you keep drawing through, and you keep drawing through. And like, that's a fine deck. The, the minion deck where you just like cycle through your deck four at a time, it's, like, it's not bad. I think it's going to be weaker than the main draw here, though, which is like Patrol, Seer, Otter even, where you try to draw all your deck at once rather than four at a time. Now, that would be like... like the minion deck would be like not... Great, but not terrible either. The deck they're actually building is minion plus a bunch of treasures, which is really, 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 really bad. Because you, the, the reason why minion works is because you can get money from like stuff like Festival and Nomad Camp mid turn. You like play those cards, and then you draw more cards. And you play the, those cards and draw more cards. Treasures have to be played after your action phase. You can only play treasure once you're in your buy phase. So if you use the minion thing, it doesn't work with treasures. Because you, like, you draw three golds in a minion, you can't like play the gold first, then play minions to draw four more cards, then play more golds, then play the minion. So you, the minion basically has one effect, which you can only really use it for the plus two coins, uh, because the discard thing doesn't function with treasures. At that point, your minion is basically just like a fancy $5 silver, which is, I mean, silver is already a bad card at three, it's a terrible card at five. So the minion sounds truly awful, uh, especially if you're playing on treasures, which, I mean, you shouldn't be. Um, and I've gotten lost on what Brick was, has been doing. Brick's bought gold. Oh, no, don't buy gold. 
And they bought Fortress. Why do you want Fortress when you have no action cards? Ay, ay, ay. Again, the purpose of Villages is to play additional action cards. If you have no action cards in your deck yet, you cannot need a village. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so we got golds upon golds upon golds upon golds. More minions. More minions. I don't even understand what these. This is basically big money ultimate. <laughs> big money ultimate being where you just buy golds and silvers, but it's worse than that because they're spending their five dollar buys on on the silvers. Hey. Gold is such a bad card. Like, if if newer players just, like, forgot gold existed and just never, ever, ever touched it, they would probably be playing closer to the optimal strategy than they, they currently are. Because it's just... The, the problem with gold is not that it's, like, terrible in the abstract. It's just that it costs more than all the good cards, which costs, like, five or less. And in almost every kingdom, there's going to be enough strong five and four dollar actions that buying a gold is going to be trading off and doing something better. And so... Gold is just such a huge opportunity cost. Like here, Sanctuary is incredible, still at 10. Seer, great, still at 10. Festival, great, still at 10. Patrol, great, still at 10. Hagler, great, still at 10. All are touching of the bad cards. Aye. And, I mean, these decks are never going to do anything. Like, you're building to single province. You could easily be doing double, triple province here. No, like, nothing. Oi, 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 This is a bit painful to watch. What do they even see in the minions? Like it is it is just a silver, the way they're using it. Why Fortress over Duchy? You are asking questions that I cannot answer. <laughs> Again, <laughs> I, I, I see many questions in chat to the effect of, why did Bricks do the following? And my answer will always be the same. And it will never be any more informative than if you were to consult Magic 8-Ball. <laughs> At this point, you just buy Duchy. They are now so far into the game that it's too late to build. Well, as I say that, they finally touched Festival. The one turn that it was a bad idea to touch Festival, they have now bought um, Festival. Uh, like, there's two provinces left. We're close enough to the end of the game that you're, there's a good chance you might never ever see that Festival again. Maybe you see it once, in which case, maybe it's like the make or break extra money to help you buy an extra duchy. If all that festival did was maybe get you one duchy, it would have been faster to just buy that duchy directly anyway. Now, festival would have been a phenomenal card early in the game, a good engine component, it adds actions, it adds buy, to build a deck that plays seers and patrols and whatnot and actually draws the deck. But at this point in the game, it's just too little too late. You should just be trying to score now, I think. Yeah, basically every good card in this kingdom has not been touched. On the upside, neither of them bought Taxman. I'll give them that. Ta Taxman ought to be a 10. Um, <sighs> that's the one thing that does make sense here. Okay, they've now seen their festival. So they can play the festival first, and then they can play Fortress's Otter. That's something. Touchy. Nope, another minion, okay. Festival first. No! Not... Oh. What? Yeah, what was I thinking? Why draw two cards when you can just choose to only draw one card? You wouldn't want to be uh, excessive there.
estate as bricks, I think you should seriously consider buying a state because you're at 23, 23, and there's two provinces left, and you're player one. So if your opponent buys province, and then you buy province right now, you lose because the score will be tied 29, 29. But if it's tied at the end of player one's turn, player one loses because they are an equal score despite having taken more turns. And so as player one, you would not want that to happen. If you take one estate here, then it makes that uh, province buy less threatening from uh, the opponent, opposing player, because then if you province back, you win now. They have instead chosen to take wedding, which is also worth one victory point, but now makes it impossible for them to hit eight here, because there's no way they're hitting 11. I mean, maybe. I guess it's conceivable. They're, they're, no, they're not hitting 11. <laughs> Okay, so I've checked. Bricks got that fortress early on. Uh, when exactly? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Turn three. They got the fortress turn three. They have not, this entire game, added a single terminal action card. The only terminal action even bought has been Nomad Camp. And that was by the opponent. So you might be thinking, oh, well, clearly they weren't planning to use the fortress as a village, right? Because... You would only need the village if you had terminal action cards, which they have literally none of. They must be planning to use the fortress as the otter for the extra draw, because fortress on its own might be useless, but it can still be technically a plus two draw. They have not a single time played that fortress using Way of the Otter. They have, they have just been playing it normally the entire game. Capricorns fortresses, at least, I can understand. They're using them to play other action cards the way of the otter, which gives them at least some claim to value. Brix's choice to buy fortress. <laughs> you just have to add it to the very long list of things I do not understand about this game. I would buy province here as Brix. You gotta take the gamble. You're not ahead. Your opponent's stack is better. It's a gamble here. It's certainly far from certain, but you're not going to win in the long game. All right, they go for it. Taking a gamble here, and it might pay off. As Capricorn, I think you draw here with Nomad Camp. Um, you're not likely to hit double gold, but even if you don't, triggering that shuffle seems pretty good for you. Because you're missed, you're causing a lot of bad cards to miss the shuffle there. I don't like trashing the state this late in the game. That extra point could end up mattering. Okay. I think you play the minion as ah. You play the minion as otter and hope to draw gold. If you play minion normally, you guarantee you cannot hit eight. I mean, I guess you could pitch the whole thing, um, but I'd much rather just draw with the minion. If you draw one gold, you win. You definitely get golds down there. Maybe Bruce doesn't understand how ways work. Have they used Way of the Otter at all? I think the answer is no. Okay, so perhaps, maybe Bricks just doesn't know how Menagerie works. So let me clarify how this functions. So this was introduced in the newest expansion, which came out earlier this year. Uh, ways are a fourth type of landscape. If a way is in the kingdom, what it means is any action card in the kingdom can be played as if it were this card in lieu of its normal effect. So for example, instead of playing your fortress as a fortress and getting this effect, you play the fortress as an otter and get this effect, the plus two cards. And so it gives you some flexibility in how you play the cards. Now, is that six games now? I, I still have no conception of time. Is that five games, six? Someone tell me. One more, okay. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, oh my, this is a strong kingdom, which I am sure they will both play successfully. So, we got a lot going on here. We got, actually, uh, no, I'm, I'm going to take that back. Never mind, it's missing one crucial component. There's no good draw here. It's not nearly as strong as I thought it was. Um, okay, this is actually uh, a reasonably mediocre kingdom. I ever said in my previous statement. So, yeah, there's a lot of strong cards here, but none of them are draw cards, and so that's going to be the biggest limitation, is there's no way to increase your hand size at all, except with horse traders. If your opponent plays an urchin as way of the mouse, you can react with your horse traders to increase your hand. Or, yeah, I guess settlers can put a copper into your hand, which can take stuff back out of your discard. Or bustling village, I guess, can take a settler out of your discard. Um, suffice to say, there's no real draw here. Like, all those are, like, terrible things that technically increase your hand size, but, um, don't actually draw in any meaningful sense. Oh, you're right, there's no busting village. Um, okay, so yes, settlers can put coppers in your hand, horse traders can react to urchin. All of it's unpretty. So you can't really build a big deck here. So what are you doing? Uh, first things first is you really want to get thin. Normally, Bounty Hunter is an amazing thinner. It sets aside a card, it's non-terminal, and it gives you three coins. That's great. I think you could consider opening Bounty Hunter here. That being said, one argument against it is uh, there's Wall Around, and Bounty Hunter quote-unquote trashes cards by exiling them rather than actually trashing them. And with Wall, those all those exiled cards will still be worth negative one point at the end of the game. And so I think I'd probably consider opening Double Urchin here instead to try to get uh, Mercenary and like actually trash my cards the Mercenary way. Well, Horse Treasures draws whether they play the... Uh, oh, you're right, you're right. I was, I was thinking the discard effect will counteract the, um, the Horse Traders draw, but Horse Traders actually kind of naturally counters Urchin's discard. It wouldn't net draw versus Mercenary, but it would versus Urchin. You're right. Um, uh, in any case, yeah, there's, there's no real draw here. We, there, there's some edge cases of draw um, that could technically get you a larger hand size. But there's no real way to draw your deck. Uh, so without that, I think you want a nice, simple deck. You play some urchins, uh, get a mercenary, you get your deck real thin, and then you might actually get some golds here. I think you could make a case for getting golds. You'll probably add a bounty hunter late with the idea of like setting aside your for provinces or fairgrounds. But I think the idea here is you want to get a nice, really thin deck you could trash down to like only a tiny number of cards and then you get a hand that's like gold, gold, silver, bounty hunter, province. And then you could exile the province, buy a new province, exile the province, buy a new province. And that would work reasonably well. The hiccup in that is going to be if they play an urchin, it could attack you. So maybe the better version of that would be like gold, gold, some markets, bounty hunter, province. And then that deck is actually resilient against urchin attacks because you would only have four stop cards, the two golds, the bounty hunter, and the province. And you just get really, really thin by playing a uh, mercenary bunch. You trash all those cards, and so walls are not going to be a concern. You need to buy one province per turn and set it aside. And you do that because there's just no way to draw your deck with no real draw cards. Now you add any draw card here like Smithy, and this kingdom I think would play fundamentally differently. You'd want to have universities, you'd want to draw with smithy, you'd want to be playing merchant guilds, maybe artificers, do a whole lot of stuff. I think you could honestly more or less ignore a wall because you could score so many points it would be largely relevant and just build really big. But given that there's no draw, I think you just, uh, you trash down and play the single province bounty hunter golden deck. Anyways, let me catch up with what they've actually done. So Capricorn goes urchin bounty hunter, that's not bad. Like, I think I prefer the double urchin, go for the early urchin play, but bounty hunter urchin seems fine. You trash early-ish with bounty hunter, get an estate into your exile, and then take the urchin to get the um, mercenary for later. Bricks goes horse traders, overlord, that seems... Yeah, it's not the worst. Turn two overlord could be justifiable. Um, Capricorn takes an overlord, okay. Bricks takes another Overlord. These Overlords aren't bad, but I'm really looking to activate my um, Urchin. 
And as Bricks, I think you really want an Urchin in your deck. As Capricorn, it could make sense to have one Urchin if you want to activate the Urchin with your Overlord. Like you play, oh yeah, here we go, Capricorn's got it. You play the Urchin, then you play the other Overlord as Urchin, and that will activate the Urchin. Yeah, so that, that seems like the clear play here. And Capricorn will get their activation off, and once you get the Mercenary in your deck, you're really happy. I mean, yeah, the, the attack is painful too, um, but Mercenary is also the only way to truly trash cards here. And with Wall Around, that distinction between trashing cards and exiling cards actually kind of matters. Double Urchin could also be a little bit stronger than normal because of Night Watchman. There might be scenarios where you'd use Night Watchman to guarantee a Double Urchin setup. Uh, in any case, that is not what we've seen. Alright, Bricks gets their Urchin. A little bit late, but I think that's a good buy. They definitely, definitely want to get the, um, what you call it, Mercenary. And a better internet connection. I sure hope not. I, I can't say, I, I cannot answer any questions about uh, Rix's strategy. Um, all I can say is what I hope they'll do. Okay, here we go, Capricorn. Overlord now, as Urchin. Okay, wrong order, but still chance. You'd want to play the Overlord first as Urchin to see maybe you draw an estate and you'd rather Bounty Hunter that away. There's no point playing the Bounty Hunter before you draw the Overlord. Ah, uh, yes, he's already pre-calculated and he's just showing off. All right, now you play this as Urchin. So you can get a Mercenary. You'd even play it as Urchin as Mouse. That'd be that'd be the best play here. That Get off, fan okay, here we go, here we go. Play the Urchin, now play it as a Mouse. No, they've played it normally. Okay. So, they, I mean, it ends up not making a difference because they hit 6 instead of 7. Um, and 7 is no better than 6. Uh, Alright. I won't criticize the gold by this time. I think gold is actually fine here because I think it's a part of the, the deck you actually end up wanting to build because there's no engine to be built, because there's no draw. Uh, I think I would take the market first. And I think the, the deck I'm looking for here has like... Or it even could be an artificer, honestly. Market and artificer are about the same for these purposes. Like in two, maybe three artificers of markets, two golds, bounty hunter, province, and that's all you want in your deck, your whole deck. Um, and I would take the market first because it's not a stop card, so it doesn't get in the way of me playing my mercenary more often. But I mean, the, the gold's not bad. It's a card you'll eventually want here. I think I'd buy Overlord here. Uh, because the Overlord can function as a market or an artificer, so rather than just buy the market outright, you could buy the Overlord and play it as market. But there's not a whole lot of other cards I really want in my deck. Okay, here we go. Now Bricks gets to get their Overlord. Or not the Overlord, they get to get their Mercenary. They play their Overlord as an Urchin. No, nope, no they don't. I, I mean, you might be thinking, like, oh, maybe they overlooked the, like, you can play Overlord as Urchin to activate the other Urchin play, but their opponent literally just did exactly that, like, two turns ago. Capricorn did the Urchin Overlord as Urchin play to activate their Urchin. So if Bricks is paying attention, they definitely know that's a possibility, and have decided, no, nah, I'd rather not have a Mercenary, I'd rather keep the Urchin around. Interesting. Do they want to buy a copper or not? They're thinking long and hard about this choice. The answer is no. Don't buy the copper. Please don't buy the copper. Good. 
good choice. Uh, you can play this as settlers. I think there's coppers down there, right? Yeah, they got coppers down there. Play this as a settlers. I think Brix's router is in fact just a brick. Nice horse traders reactions there. I don't know why no way. I mean, you could theoretically conclude the getting the attack in is better than getting the extra copper. I don't think the answer is. I don't think it actually is, but like maybe you could think that. Capricorn might have a sad mercenary play coming up here. No, 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 no. They, they can play all. They can play urchin, overlord, and play bounty hunter as um, settlers if need be. They'll definitely draw at least two junk cards to trash. All right, Briggs gets a gold. That would make a lot more sense if they'd already trashed a bit. Capricorn's gold at least seemed defensible because they had the mercenary already, and the deck's getting thin. Briggs really needs to get that mercenary. They have another hand where they can do it. We'll see if they do do it. Right, here we go. I would play the Overlord as market. I guess, yeah, there, there's no draw here where you don't play the Bounty Hunter as Way of the Mouse. Maybe you could do that first as well. Either order seems fine. Now, do you turn the other urchin into a second mercenary? I think your deck might be thin enough now that the answer is no. But there's also very little downside to doing that because, like, I mean, you can play the mercenary as settlers if you need to. Oh, bricks. Bricks has disconnected 15 times this game, or this match. That's a lot. Artificer, that seems fine. Don't discard anything. Play the Bounty Hunter as a mouse to draw on. Now, well, why, why are we not? Maybe Capricorn doesn't know how ways work. No, no, Capricorn knows how ways work. They're using the ways last game. Are they going to trash the Bounty Hunter? Is that the idea? I don't think you want to trash the Bounty Hunter. Okay, so they trashed two coppers, which would make sense. But then it makes me wonder why they just did not play their Bounty Hunter and draw an extra card for free. Just an Overlord here. Could be a second gold. Could be Market. Market seems good. I'm down with that. Look at their ban list. Actually, oh my, that's a, a small ban list. 0% procession, or possession. Possession. That, I don't know, why can't I pronounce that? 0% possession, fool, and devil's workshop. 50% uh, cultist. Uh, I don't know why they have devil's workshop banned. <laughs> oh, no, they're on to us. <laughs> they see us. Uh-oh. Uh. <laughs> yeah, there have been a lot of spectators here for a while now. Uh Hiya, Bricks. Okay. Coldest, very reasonable card to dislike. Um, yeah, like you, you can ban up to five cards and three landmarks and dislike up to five and three more. Uh, I, I would max out my list. You know, like, surely, a, with a game with, like, 360 cards, there's got to be at least, like, ten that grind your gears. Ban the worst five, dislike the other five, so they only show up half as often. And you get higher quality games. These people who are willing to play with every card just seem... That, that's just too courageous for my blood. 
Like, for example, Swindler. I will never, ever, ever play a game of Dominion that has Swindler in it. <laughs> that card is just the devil incarnate. Devil's Workshop, however, despite having the devil in the name, is much more friendly. The Sideways cards. I love events and I love projects. Those are, are wonderful. Ways are pretty solid as well. Uh, landmarks can be hit or miss. Like, I dislike Colonnade. I really dislike Battlefield. And I think I also have Aqueduct banned. Just because I like to use my ban list as much as possible. Um, but yeah, in general, I think the um, the sideways cards are, are often very pleasant. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would like Swindler too if I was on a plan like a money match versus Naismith or something. I think it's skill multiplier is like 0.75 or something. So, like, you are a full 25% less likely to win as the better player if Swindler's in the kingdom compared to if you just play with a random set of non Swindler cards. Baths is just boring. I don't have any active distaste for it, but it's basically just like rolling, not having it a landmark. Okay, Capricorn's deck is getting pretty clean. I think we're getting towards uh, what this deck ought to look like. I'm liking this. This is, I think, the first game we've actually seen people trash and appropriate. Why'd you discard those? Okay, they can draw them back. Play the Bounty Hunter first as Settlers. You can put the Copper back in your hand, and then you can draw another card and trash it. Yeah, the VP per player ones are often quite boring for that reason. I agree with that. I don't like the ones that encourage bad habits. Like, Battlefield gives you points for buying provinces too early. Or Colonnade gives you points for buying monolithic decks. And that's annoying because it sort of splits the difference between, like, if you play the right strategy, you're punished for it, and if you play a bad strategy, you're rewarded for it. I like stuff like Tomb, where the thing I wanted to do anyway, like trash all my cards, I get bonus victory points for doing the thing I already wanted to do. Tomb's a great landmark. Probably my favorite. <laughs> Why are they exiling the mercenary? They need to, do they have two merchant mercenaries? Maybe that's it. Capricorn definitely missed out on the opportunity to trash there. Uh, they discarded the cards that they should have been trashing with mercenary and then didn't bother to draw them back up. But they'll still get the opportunity to trash here. I don't like that gold buy. You only need two golds in this deck. Like once your deck gets thin, you will have enough golds to buy province every turn, and that number is two, because you have like market and overlord, which you can play as market, and then you can exile the province, buy a new province. You don't need a bunch of golds. Capricorn here should discard the copper, I would think, because you can draw the copper back up with settlers, but I could also see an argument for discarding the gold, knowing that you're likely to draw junk um, if maybe you overlook the settlers play. Yeah, Ritual seems like a really nice concept. If the numbers were balanced a little bit better to make it more playable, it'd be real interesting. It's just like, it's too expensive and too little value. Like, imagine if Ritual were like, you can trash a card from play for that number of victory points. That would start to sound real interesting. Because like, you could Ritual the gold without losing the three coins from it. Then I think I would start, start to play Ritual a lot. Okay, play this Urchin as Settlers... Settlers, please. Ah! You know there's a copper down there. You know your mercenary needs to trash two cards. Put the copper in your hand so you can actually trash. Mm. Wait, why didn't they even... I think Capricorn has just forgotten how ways work. They were using Way of the, uh, way of the Otter last game. And not only did they not do like the optimal play, which is play the urchin as way of the mouse as settlers to be able to trash with their mercenary, they didn't even play their mercenary. Like they, even if they were like, oh no, I've only drawn one card, the estate, I can't trash with my mercenary. You could still play the mercenary as settlers to draw, 
and draw a free card. Hey! All right, Capricorn has noticed that they are overlooking um, Way of the Mouse. I mean, you really should have moused the first action, but I mean, the last action would have been better than nothing. We have noticed, Bricks. We have noticed. <laughs> this is bringing back bad memories of last game, when they played their for uh, fortress as a way of the otter a total of zero times, despite that being the correct play 100% of the time. <laughs> Do you discard here is Capricorn? Uh, if I were paying better attention to Capricorn's deck, I would like to know whether they had two junk cards coming up. If I knew I could get at least two junk cards into my hand, I would discard the two golds and then draw those junk cards so I could trash my mercenary. I really dislike the Overlord discard. I would discard, like even if I weren't going for the mercenary trash, you discard like mercenary gold and then play the Overlord as like a market. I really want them to finish off trashing, but they're just really, really avoiding that. Would that have let you grab a mercenary? I think what Bricks is asking is like, let's say you play an urchin and then you play the other urchin as way of the mouse. Can you still get the mercenary activation off of that? And the answer is yes, because what the first urchin cares about is whether you played an attack card. And so it's going to check that the moment you put that card into play. So if you play the second urchin, it's like, oh, there's a card that has the class attack in play, and it gives you the option to immediately trash that urchin. And then after resolving that thing, that's when, technically speaking, you would decide whether to play it as a way of the mouse or normally. And so uh, you could definitely uh, trash. It's for the same reason that, like, you could trash your urchin with an overlord, because you're, all right, I think it's not quite the same reason, but like very similarly, Urchin as Overlord as Urchin. All that really matters is you have played an attack card. That's all that it checks. Doesn't matter any further details, that sort of thing. Likewise, like Minion, for example. You could play an Urchin, then play a Minion, and you'd be able to trash for Mercenary, even if you chose the plus two coins option. You know, the plus two coins option for Minion isn't really an attack. It doesn't attack your opponent at all. But you've still played an attack card, even if you didn't choose to like discard your opponent's hand choice. Capricorn now misleading bricks about how that functions. A third mercenary that seems like more than you need, given that you're not using your first two. All right. Capricorn gonna trash these last two coppers. I don't think I've ever actually read the rule book, <laughs> admittedly. I think I, I mostly learned the rules, like the, the, the detailed rules and all from like trial and error, playing the game and whatnot. And then occasionally be a thing where I'll be like, why does it work like that? Is the online client bugged? And I'll like message the Discord or something and be like, this seems like a bug. And every time I end up being wrong. And I've learned that the the game is actually quite well coded. And there's some bugs out there, but they're very, very rare and niche. Wait, 
No, Capricorn can't have... Oh, do they have four now? Oh, oh yeah, they do have four. They've got a fourth one. That's so many mercenaries. Why do you want that many? <laughs> what are you doing with them all? Capricorn should discard a single province and a gold here. I would love to exile the other province with the bounty hunter. Okay, that, that's a fine order as well. They trashed an overlord. That is... Well, that's something. What was in their hand at that point? Yeah, I'm not sure what, what made them think that made sense. Okay, as Capricorn here, I'm definitely trashing my other two mercenaries with this mercenary. Uh, do you discard the Overlord of the Gold? I'm not sure. Probably the Gold, I would think. Well, they chose neither of those. Okay. Do they have coppers left? I don't think so. Market, okay. All right. Capricorn has learned, learned from the errors. They know now that they're supposed to play the mercenary as way of the mouse. They're going to... Okay, all right, they're doing it. They're learning. We're getting somewhere. I think I might be willing to trash that gold to trash the mercenary and get an attack in. Wait, no! Why didn't they play those mercenaries? They... So like a few turns back, they had this thing where they had mercenaries left and they're like, I'm gonna end my turn and not play these to draw one. And then they're like, whoopsie daisy, that was a mistake. I've learned my lesson. I should play my mercenaries as the way of the mouse. And they did that exactly once this turn. <laughs> And then when it came time to do it a second time, they're like, mm, nah, once was enough. It wasn't a bad reshuffle, though. They had their bounty hunter down there in a singular province, which is like exactly what you want to see. And they had two draw. It was, it was very much a shuffle I'd be happy to trigger. Especially because, like, even if you were to draw like just a bounty hunter and just a mercenary, they can never really be dead cards because you can just mouse them again. <sighs> Duchies seem really gross in a wall game. It's just really hard to outscore provinces with duchies with a wall around because instead of being worth half as many points as province, they're functionally worth 40% as many points. So you need a lot more duchies to compensate. You could try to go for fairgrounds, but again, wall makes fairgrounds kind of annoying because you don't want to have to collect a bunch of random cards to power them up because those cards will be worth negative one point each. This is looking like Capricorn's game, I would think. Do you buy anything here? Perhaps not. I think I might just pass. Could consider Night Watchman, maybe. Trigger a good shuffle. Discard whatever you don't want. I think I would have just passed there, though. I'll just let me discard the province here. Why the mercenary? I'd be considering wanting to bounty hunter the mercenary now for the three coins. We have seen seven mercenaries gained this game. <laughs> 
It should be more than four two, right? Or is one trashed already? Because there's there's seven mercenaries missing from the pile. Four two can't be right. Let's see. Gains a merc. Yeah, it's four three. I think the normal choice is between one and two mercenaries. The only time I've ever gotten three or more, I think, is with a fortress around. Capricorn keeps buying unnecessary cards, and they've now lost themselves the lead. Because they were up points, and they just bought a bunch of extra actions that they didn't need to play. Is it though? There was actually one game I played where mercenary split was like the defining factor of the game. It had it was a single by kingdom with mercenary, tomb, and fortress, and mission. So the optimal strategy was just to play like five mercenaries every turn for ten points, and then buy mission and play five more mercenaries again for ten more points, and the game was just like a total stalemate. <laughs> And so, looking back, I don't think I, I thought about it at first, but the optimal strategy in that kingdom was very likely just... Oh, someone's got their volume on. Uh, Ramius1212, can you mute yourself on Discord? Um, but in that kingdom, it actually might have been strategic to just like open Quintuple Urchin to try to like get ahead on the Urchin split. <laughs> because whoever won the Mercenary split in that kingdom was very likely going to win the game. Yeah, it is, it is frustrating to me that, that Capricorn has just progressively declined in points while uh, Brix has gained. They managed to be losing this game now. It's at least close. They've now relearned to mouse their mercenaries again. That's good. Okay, they're at 9, 11. Uh, 11 is not the best number. Is Fairgrounds worth anything? I think you might do Fairgrounds Duchy here. Yeah, I think you exile the province and do Fairgrounds Duchy. I don't think as Capricorn you need to take this risk. You could try buying the province, but you're behind in points and you have the better deck. You should play it safe by Fairgrounds Duchy. Or maybe du double Duchy. They have 10, 10, 10 unique cards. They've got Copper, Estate, Province, Gold, Urchin, Mercenary, Bounty Hunter, Market, Overlord, yeah, Dutchy and Fairgrounds, they'd have 10. So the Fairgrounds would be worth 4 points. So Fairgrounds Dutchy would have been better than Double Dutchy there. They passed up on a, a free point. Yeah, I guess technically 3 VP because Wall's around. But in any case, the Fairgrounds was better than the Dutchy. They just gave away a free point for nothing. Also, Fairgrounds is another unique card. So, rather than exiling two duchies and only having three points from one of your bounty hunters, you could exile a duchy and a fairground and get three points or three coins from both. Wait, uh, I was wondering why they discarded the overlord, but I guess their plan is. Now that still doesn't make sense. Why would you discard the overlord? I mean, they're gonna they're gonna duchy the bounty hunter. All the way around, they're they're gonna bounty hunter the duchy. <laughs> um. But, like, why would you keep the mercenary rather than the overlord? <laughs> yeah, overlord must be a terrible card. One of them is trashing it, the other one keeps discarding it. <laughs> one makes uh, you wonder why, why they have five overlord, overlords to begin with. Why did I pay 8 debt for mercenary food? Play that as a mouse. Hit undo. Or maybe, oh, I, I, never mind. I, th I think they're going to try to play it as a mouse and it's just waiting for Bricks to react. I thought they'd accidentally played it normally. If they hit 7, I'm going to be annoyed.
Because they could have had eight. If they just discarded the mercenary. I realized what was going on. <laughs> Alright. Capricorn going in for the kill. Don't buy an estate. Estate is worth zero points. No, that's you're just, you're just junking your deck for nothing. This wall around that estate does not score. What would Bricks need here? Would 13 win? I mean, can they, they can't do 13, but... Yeah, I, I like the Mercenary play. Mercenary scores you two points here. Is that enough to win? Not quite. That would tie, though, right? Yeah, Bricks could take the tie here. Am I miscounting this? They trash Silver and Horse Traders, and then buy Province. They score six points, and their deck is one thinner than before because they trashed two and gained one. That would be a tie. Yeah. And then maybe if they miraculously drew a bunch of treasures or something, they could maybe buy a duchy or something. But most likely just a tie. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, so they're, they're discarding that. This doesn't work. This doesn't work at all. If you were planning to play the horse traders, you should have at least played your mercenary as way of the mouse first to see what you might have drawn, because maybe it could be better. Like, if they drew a gold, then they could have, like, horse traded the silver and... The... Okay, they're just killing themselves now for some reason. This, this is literally just suicide. Why are they doing this? Maybe they forgot about wall points. Okay. That was a weird forfeit. I mean, at the very least, they could have bought, like, Fairgrounds and hoped that their opponent would dud. I don't understand why they just threw the game for no reason. <laughs> I think winning is appropriately rated. All right, then. That was the sixth game, now that you're listening to me. Uh, I don't even know what the final score was. I think it was it five one for Capricorn. I think it's been two and a half hours, right? I think it's been two and a half. It was a longish match. Yep, uh, good games and good luck, y'all, in the future league matches. I'll see everybody around. <laughs>